Thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, sticking around. I know there's a good Matplotlib talk going on next door. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some development in uh, the volume render within the YT software stack. So uh, this is work uh, with Matthew Turk, who's in the audience, and uh, a bunch of other people in the YT community. Uh, so first of all, what is YT? Uh, kind of our, our mission statement is to, to uh, provide detailed data analysis and visualizations. Uh, this is a tool that's written by working astrophysicists, uh, kind of for now, but really we're open to other branches of science. Uh, and it's designed for pragmatic analysis and needs, so it's really need-driven. Um, so you might be wondering, what is, what is actually YT? Well, YT doesn't really stand for anything, but uh, I like to say that we stand for open source software, community-driven development, uh, and community-developed software. Uh, and we want to ask physical questions about our data and not worry about the underlying format of our, of our data, how it's laid out in memory, uh, all the bookkeeping that no one actually cares about. A uh, little bit more background on the YT project. Uh, if you go to olo.net, there's some really cool stats. Uh, the bottom line here is that there's now over 9,000 commits, about 120,000 lines of code. Uh, we have a very large, uh, according to them, mature code base. Uh, with lots of cool development going on. Uh, one, of the, one of the really neat plots is uh, the, computer, the contributors over the course of time. Uh, and this is just kind of monotonically increasing. And this is contributors per month. So if you average this over kind of a couple more months, that graph would be a little bit higher even. So this is really cool. I uh, invite you to all take a look at Matt's paper on, on scaling such a code that's driven by the community. Uh, in, in the human dimension, as he calls it. So, so what does YT actually do here? Uh, our focus is to do analysis and visualization and be the best that we possibly can at doing that. Uh, we provide a lot of front-end loaders to many astrophysical data sets, uh, and we're starting to branch into more general uh, visualization techniques for, for general data layouts. So if you're an astronomer, you might see all these code names up here, and you'll realize that that now encompasses really a majority of the codes in at least cosmological astrophysical simulations. Uh, and we're branching into things like Athena and uh, kind of uniform data and Castro. And so you're starting to branch out into even all of the branches of computational astrophysics. Uh, there's lots of papers on the archive. Uh, do things, simple things like slices or projections or phase plots. Um, and really, the, the real challenge here is that what you're given out of an astrophysical simulation that's complex uh, in these days, you're not doing many uniform grid simulations at this point where the data access is very simple. What you end up having is some complex data hierarchy uh, that you don't actually care about as a scientist, but you have to deal with as a computational scientist. And what YT does is handle that all on the back end so that you can ask kind of uh, physical data questions. How dense is this region? Give me a sphere of this region about, around my galaxy and tell me bulk properties. But I don't care about uh, what's going on, on the, underneath. Uh, so YT does a, a lot of really great things. Today I'm going to talk about uh, volume rendering. Uh, most of you already know, but the basic process here is you take some physical quantity, uh, a density, say, uh, and you map that through a transfer function to produce uh, RGBA emissivities. Uh, and you might have opacities associated with that. But it's really the process of transforming numbers into pictures, right? So you can take a, you know, a billion numbers and transform it into something beautiful like this, which is a visualization of a, of a portion of a galaxy where stars are forming out of uh, cooling molecular clouds. Uh, so color here corresponds to gas density. Uh, in the regions over here, you can see where stars might form. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of Jonathan Tan at University of Florida. Uh, so, so the goals behind volume rendering, uh, and specifically the volume rendering framework that we implemented in YT, uh, is that we want to render the AMR data hierarchy natively. Uh, this started out as being only an adaptive mesh refinement-like uh, simulation. Uh, because when you have, say, 30 levels of adaptive mesh refinement, you can't regrid that to a uniform grid because you'd take up 
uh, the entire disk of a supercomputer. So regridding is not an option. So we really want to sample along every cell along that line of sight and do it the best that we possibly can and get the highest quality image that we can. And then later, we'll worry about performance issues. And so this provided a, lo a lot of challenges to us because we had all these complex data structures. We have to partition the data in memory across many nodes of a supercomputer if it's large data. Uh, you have to figure out some way to yield the data from back to front because you have to uh, integrate along the line of sight uh, in a particular order or else you'll get out of order effects in your, in your visualization. We want this to be fast because we don't want to spend hours upon hours making a single render. Uh, and we want to exploit parallelism on a supercomputer scale because we need both speed and we need memory because some of these data sets are uh, many gigabytes in size, cannot fit in a single node, and so you have to partition uh, the data itself. Uh, so part of this talk is kind of how this all is developed. And so I want to go through a little bit of a history behind uh, the rendering uh, framework in YT. So in about 2008, uh, uh, Matt developed the first version of the renderer. Uh, and I was kind of a brand new grad student. I was like, hey, what's this YT thing? It looks kind of cool. Uh, by 2010, the, the renderer was pretty, uh, pretty established at that point. It had a very optimized way of uh, traversing grids. Uh, using Cython to walk the grids itself. Uh, by that time, I was fully addicted to volume rendering because they were producing these gorgeous images, and I wanted more of them, and I wanted them faster. Uh, and so I started working actually through a, a class project in a computer science course uh, on building a KD tree decomposition of an AMR hierarchy of grids, uh, which is Something I'll, I'll kind of show what that means in the next slide. Uh, by the next year, uh, Matt kind of took his reins off the render a bit, uh, allowed me to, to take lead on it. Uh, and then the first version of this KD tree was pulled into the code base. Uh, and it was, it was pretty good. It was capable of handling very large data sets uh, and traversing them in the right order. By 2012, uh, we had implemented uh, much more interesting things like multi-level parallelism that exploits parallelism in the image plane, the data decomposition, and the threading of the, the ray integration for each individual brick. So uh, there's three levels of parallelism, and there's really more if we wanted to think about it. This allowed us to do really cool things like 32,000 squared image, uh, 32,000 squared pixel renders of giant AMR data sets. Uh, it was used to do 3,600 cube element unigrid simulations. It was used to, use, to do billion element adaptive mesh refinement simulations. This has now proved its uh, power of handling the largest data sets that astronomers can really throw at it. Uh, so, so this KD tree is something that takes a structured AMR data set uh, that you see on the left here, where the grids are kind of overlapping. They, uh, are not particularly well ordered in space. Uh, you can't really ensure ordering because if you view it from one direction over here, uh, it's non-trivial to yield those bricks in a way that will allow you to render it uh, back to front. So what I did was create uh, a KD tree, which is a natural way to create splitting planes that divide up a, a region of space into things that are behind and in front of a, a given point in space. Uh, that allows you to do very simple traversal from any direction you want, even from within the data set itself, uh, by just comparing splitting planes to where, wherever you're viewing from. Uh, in addition to this, this was done in a, K, a parallel way, such that the KD tree itself is also domain decompositioned. So now you can run uh, you know, a few hundred or uh, so processors, and it'll build a distributed KD tree that it, you don't even actually have to reduce in the end uh, because you just hand off each KD tree to a different processor, and that's the piece that that processor owns. Uh, this scales kind of super linearly because it cuts down on the number of nodes, and the, the, the tree is kind of like an n log n type scaling. Uh, so really cool. Uh, and so what this shows is uh, kind of domain decomposition of a small data set. 
uh, where color specifies the uh, order in which you have to yield the, the individual pieces to the rendering uh, uh, engine on, underneath. Uh, and so you see in, in the back, the back regions always stay kind of blue, uh, and the red regions are always in the front, and so that provides a very natural way to, to walk your simulation. So this allowed us to do really cool things with fairly large data. What I'm going to show you is a, a 2048 cube simulation where each field is 64 gigabytes. Uh, this is uh, run on 128 processors. And the key point here is that this rendering is run on the same computer, the same supercomputer that ran the simulation in the first place. This is really useful because you don't want to be moving your terabytes of data around the world even across rooms to an analysis cluster away from the supercomputer. So this is uh, a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability simulation, and this kind of just spins around and views a, a single snapshot in time. Um, each frame here took about three or four, uh, maybe five or six seconds, uh, but it really allows you to get in there and visualize these really complex uh, instabilities and secondary instabilities that are occurring in this, in this simulation. Um, more recently, we applied this to a uh, 3600 cube radiation hydrodynamics simulation. Uh, this is truly massive amount of data. Uh, and uh, this is a, a simulation run by Mike Norman out at San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, the full resolution of this uh, volume rendering is 4096 squared. Uh, so that the top left view shows you the zoomed out region and the, the three other panels show zoom in to individual regions where ionization bubbles are processing out through uh, uh, an intergalactic medium uh, ionizing the universe. Uh, and so this tool is, is, has proved very useful. Um, you can also run it in uh, kind of time series. This, this is a simulation from my PhD thesis. Uh, and this is a kind of synchrotron emission, which is radio emission from a, a cluster of galaxies that are forming. And so what you can do with this, this framework is if uh, uh, look at the time evolution of a simulation, modify the transfer function to pick out interesting regions, uh, create fairly complex camera paths to really inspect what's going on in the regions that you care about most. Uh, this this, simu this uh, rendering itself uh, is about a thousand frames or so, also run on a kind of half billion cell data set. Uh, so still fairly large. Uh, it then evolves again and zooms out uh, after the emission has kind of fallen off a bit. And the, the piece that I like here at the end is where the transfer function then changes again to reveal the underlying low-level uh, radiation that was hidden from view that I use to, to say that maybe with kind of next generation radio telescopes, we might be able to reveal what's actually underneath all this, which would be really cool. But that's another story. So. Where is the project now? Well, now Matt and I are kind of uh, getting more interested in doing general volumetric uh, rendering. Uh, this is taking point data, arbitrarily kind of shaped data, and we want, really want to apply the lessons learned from developing this, this tool that we found extremely useful to expand our reach to other astrophysical domains as well as other scientific domains uh, so just as I came in uh, a couple years after Matt started developing this initial framework, the same thing is happening again, where uh, multiple both new contributors and old contributors are starting to take the reins. And I'm kind of now trying to step back and allow that to happen. Uh, it's, it's really great to let people come in and you know, first screw up what you had done and then make it better. Um, so they're starting to work on some camera refactors to, to more easily specify the camera path. Um, so what you should be doing is talking to us. Because even if you're not an astronomer, we want to know what your data looks like. And we want to talk to you. Because if this looks good to you, uh, you should talk to us. A few examples of people who came out and talked to us. Uh, here's an example of weather data. This is a thunderstorm where on the left, there's a rendering of a pressure perturbation. Uh, and you know, there's a very low pressure cell right in the center there. And cool thing about weather data is there's a snow field in the simulation. 
Uh, this is kind of one of the first renderings where I felt like I was actually simulating and rendering something real. Um, uh, another example was uh, a tomography data set. So this is a uh, rendering of basically uh, depth in the, in the, into the board uh, direction. Uh, and you kind of see the continents there. Uh, and so you can start looking at uh, perturbations in, in uh, the Earth's density and start visualizing that, visualizing that sort of thing. Um, another application that's recently come up is seismology. Uh, this is a great picture, I think, because uh, uh, it's a YT rendering in the background. And with seismologists, they have all these uh, sensors that sense what happens when an earthquake would run through the Earth. Uh, and that actually produces sound. So that you can sit in the middle of this thing and hear the sound of, of what an earthquake would, would sound like while watching it in a volume rendering uh, on the screen. Uh, now, if you're real quiet, uh, you might be able to hear it play on my, my laptop. I don't think there's any sort of... Uh... Oh. The next one's a little better. So this is, again, a volume rendering of an earthquake where uh, waves are propagating through the Earth, uh, <laughs> reflecting around. Uh, very cool. I have no idea, really, what, it, what you get out of this as, a, as an earthquake scientist, but uh, pretty cool. It sounds like thunder. So. So this is actually a finite element uh, simulation that was then regridded to a, a, a data structure that YT can understand. Uh, so lots of lots of possibilities for not classically astrophysics data sets. Um, I want to talk about a, a few more uh, future things and cool things that uh, I've done recently, kind of just playing around. Uh, one of which is. I, I took Canopy plus IPython Notebook, uh, installed YT, loaded up Maya VI, uh, took a cosmological data set of my own, uh, sampled it into a, a way that Maya VI could understand, rendered it, played around with it in real time. Uh, this is just to point out that YT is kind of a flexible framework, so it can plug in with other tools that you're all used to using uh, uh, fairly easily. Uh, this was uh, surprisingly easy to set up in my mind. Um, the next example I want to do is uh, YT combined with IPython Notebook combined with something that Jake Vanderplas uh, came up with, which is a, uh, a JavaScript viewer for, for Matplotlib uh, visualizations. And let me see if I can do this real quickly. Uh, what we did here is do a bunch of setup for uh, uh, an, a back-end parallel engine in IPython Notebook, uh, load up YT, load up some data sets, set up Oops, that's not any useful for you guys. Uh, let's see, this is more useful. So start up a uh, IPython uh, cluster engine, uh, load up YT, uh, set up a camera, uh, do an initial rendering to make sure that this looks OK. This is temperature of a cosmological data set. Uh, Start doing a rotation, uh, get some images. This is where the JS animation comes in. Uh, and at the bottom here, we'll see if this actually plays. There's the jump that we have all heard about. And so now you can run this all in an IPython notebook with a parallel IPython cluster on the back end so that you can exploit the parallelism and do it more quickly, which is what you always want to do. Um, so this was pretty cool. This was a, a Friday afternoon in between when I submitted my thesis and when I was defending it. So that was fun. Um, a few more slides here, and I'll be done. Uh, so the takeaways here is that uh, what we've learned in the YT community is uh, encourage your users to play and break things, because then they'll quickly become developers and contributors back to your own project. It's really about fostering this community of developers that I think is what has made the YT project such a success in my mind. Uh, parallel volume rendering in YT, it combines all the greatest things in Python 
to produce really amazing looking visualizations. Uh, in the future, it's all about faster, more configurable, different types of data. Uh, and it's not for astronomers, not just for astronomers anymore, so uh, come play with us. Uh, thank you to the SciPy organizers, the community. Uh, please come introduce yourself and bring your data. Uh, Twitter and Google Plus, and I think there's Facebook, so go to town. Thanks. Here we go. Um, I'd like to say that I, I've had a lot of, I've had some experience over the past 18 months working with the YT team, and they've just been great. So I think, uh, and now I'm not an astrophysicist. Um, you know, I was doing high energy density physics, now I do nuclear engineering stuff. But you all should invent reasons to work with these people. <laughs> so. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, so the question is, can YT work on data, uh, smaller data sets uh, in a more interactive way? Uh, in, in some ways, yes. Uh, for the volume rendering, it's still uh, uh, a little bit script-based, but we're working on uh, exploring uh, uh, things like Maya VI integration so that you can move things around in Maya VI and set up camera paths more easily to then toss to the high-quality render in the back end. Um, there's uh, several interactive ways to, to work with YT outside of the volume rendering that, that are fairly interactive. We have a web-based GUI uh, that we're hoping to integrate more closely with IPython in the future. So you can explore your data. You can create um, uh, kind of maps that you can zoom in and out of uh, fairly easily. So uh, the render, it takes a little bit more work. But uh, for other pieces, it's, it's quite interactive. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's been other. Uh, there's been an XTK renderer that you can also drag around and, and look at contours. And uh, but the high the high quality renderer is not is not there in interactive way. Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, a, a few things are up on, uh, so this one that does the, the JS animation thing is up on uh, what we call the hub. So hub.ytproject.org holds a bunch of uh, notebooks and other scripts that are useful to use within YT. Um, a lot of these uh, uh, scripts are available there, and there's... Uh, a lot of cookbooks and tutorials up on the documentation for YT itself. So just go to ytproject.org, and it'll it'll point you to the right place. Um, so the question is, to, is there any experience doing kind of biological data sets? Um, not, not yet. Uh, there's someone talking to us to start thinking about molecular dynamics type simulations. Um, but if it's volumetric in some way, uh, there's, there's, there's a possibility there. So, um, And the, one of the really powerful things is to make uh, kind of derived fields and derived quantities from your, your full data set. So if you have something and, and you really want a, a different field that you derive from that, you can very quickly generate that and just write the script in Python to convert it. Uh, so it's, it's very extensible in terms of what you can define. So it's extremely useful. And a lot of things are kind of transparently parallel if the data is large. So. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks.